Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. A um, few things I have to say. One is we personally are involved both as a lifestyle, a ketogenic diet, but also through my 16 years of clinical practice of what is effective. What do people need to take sometimes, all the time, to support their ketogenic diet? You'll get bits and pieces of this ongoing week after week. It's important to be comprehensive in one way it's simple and one way it's a little bit complicated. Hi, this is Dr. Goldkamp, back for part two of the history and the evolution of the ketogenic diet. And I'd like to review some important points that we sort of covered last week. And I'd like to go a little further in depth. I think the context of understanding these changes is very important, so there will be some overlap, okay? So part of the review with greater detail is what I mentioned before, that there's these in essence, inflection points in at least the history of the ketogenic diet and the things that contributed to it. So I want to paint that for you. And one inflection point, this is per my perspective, was a year of intense near coincidences. So they're not coincidences, but they're different parts of medicine working on pretty similar things that are coming up with nearly the same answer. And then it all disappears for about 80 years. So what I call the first inflection point is 1918 to 1922. So what happened then in 1918, which besides the end of World War II and the big pandemic of the Spanish flu, was Otto Warburg in Germany received the Nobel Prize for discovering that low oxygen was characteristic of cancer cells. And the cancer did not require oxygen, but used glucose respiration. That's considered a, a primitive respiration, to use sugar. So it pre-existed, you know, back in the very fundamental one cell and two cell when, when life was just getting started on the earth, it is presumed that it was basically a sugar metabolism because at that time oxygen was toxic. So that was the metabolism for survival at that point. So when Otto Warburg was discovering that cancer coexisted in a low oxygen environment, that was a big deal. And that it I won't say the word grew, but it depended on glucose, what they call fermentation of sugar is how it was phrased, but glucose for cellular respiration. That's impressive. And that's, so why am I laying it out that way? Because the connecting thought, this doesn't actually get connected. The connecting thought is the cancer runs on sugar. You've probably heard that if you're listening to this podcast already, but that was a very old idea. Cancer runs on sugar. And you can pretty much say, yep, that's true. Otto, Otto Warburg discovered that, got the Nobel Prize for it, and then nothing much happened to it at all, ever. Because we're going to cover this in the future of today. We're going to go in the future today, and we're going to talk about, well, there's an alternative fuel to sugar. If cancer depends on sugar, why don't we starve it from sugar and feed it ketones, okay? So that's a very modern era thinking, and that's just now being tried out in many different studies. So I'm jumping back and forth on time, but I'm saying the seed was sown for this particular thinking 100 years ago, exactly 100 years ago uh, this year. We're now 2018. Okay, also in that four-year period, as we talked about last week, was it in 1921, the ketogenic diet was defined and implemented for pediatric epilepsy. Do you remember how the only cure, the only treatment for pediatric epilepsy and epilepsy in general was fasting? And they fasted children for over 20 days. The average was 20. So they gave them a water fast, but that's it. That's it. Just a water fast. It's amazing. So what they found, and I'm repeating myself a little bit from last week, but it's a good review, is that some children actually, absolutely uh, up 30%, 28, 30% actually were cured. They never had another episode in their life after they fasted for that long. All of them had reduced seizures after the fasting ended. All of them, all of their seizures stopped for everybody. All the children that went through this particular treatment had a cessation of seizures while they fasted at some point in the fasting, towards the end of the fasting. Very interesting, eh? So in 1922, I actually want to go back a little bit. Part of the ketogenic diet was developed to treat epilepsy, but the formulation of the diet really came from reviewing diabetics' blood work and the high ketones that diabetics had. And the data was much better in terms of diets and blood work for diabetics. So it was a review of the diabetic 
blood work and diets that led to looking for a diet that would lead to high ketone bodies, what they called ketonemia. And at the point before the development of this particular diet, they simply, they could identify the ketone bodies. There's three different ketone bodies. And they thought, well, these are just all artifacts. These are waste products of the liver trying to deal with seizures. That's So they saw of no value. But they did notice in the diabetics blood work and that it was it was a sign of illness as well. That is when you had ketoacidosis, you had high ketones, then even higher glucose. But they were looking for a diet, trying to contrive, if you will, a diet to simply create high ketone bodies in a human. And they were thinking of the children. They didn't think it was going to be healthy. They thought, well, at least try this and check this and check this off and we'll move on to other things. And they found that it was extremely effective. In fact, it was equally effective to treating epilepsy. However, in implementing that, the ketogenic diet for a pediatric epilepsy, they still required the children to fast for usually a couple days and then start at one third of the diet and the next day, two thirds of the diet and then three thirds of the diet. And that was continued all the way up to uh, even currently, actually. Um, We'll get into the modern era of treating epilepsy in a little bit. So the last part of that four-year period was in 1922, is that in Canada, insulin was isolated, and it was the first time it was actually given to a human, a a child, a 13-year-old boy who had type 1 diabetes, and they normalized his life. And that was a huge breakthrough. It was two doctors, a Frederick Banting and a Charles Best. Really interesting story. Later, I will do a chapter on the history of diabetes because it really coincides with the development of the ketogenic diet. Um, and there's a lot to a lot of thinking. I think it's a, a good context to think from because now the largest areas for improvement of the ketogenic diet are in diabetics, obviously epileptics and cancer and neurological illnesses, which you can sort of say came from working with epileptics. Okay. So just one or two more sentences about the discovery and the isolation and the use of insulin was that these two doctors also won the Nobel Prize, by the way, and they uh, did patent the uh, formulation and the method for isolating insulin, and they made that patent free for everybody. Isn't that an incredible perspective? I mean, at times have changed so much. That would have been a colossal moneymaker. Huge but they made it free. Eli the Pharmaceuticals was the one that did the patent on that. But that's just amazing. It's uh, back also when you think of the polio vaccine was also patented, but was never charged. There was no royalties. He gave it away for free. That era of thinking just floors me, uh, too, favorably floors me, that what they, they, knew that they knew what they gave up, and they thought that they were not going to hold anybody hostage to money who uh, needed their vaccine, or in this case, the insulin. Okay, so that was a period of 1918 to 1922. I think that these pieces are going to come back together later in the future, but put that in the back of your mind. All right, also reviewing, we're going to jump up to 1958. I mentioned there was two medical publications in two different parts of the world in the same year. One was in the U.S. That was by Dr. Pennington's, and it was called Weight Loss, talk about a blunt title, and that was put in JAMA, and that was all about treating obesity. Very straightforward. 48 patients succeeded in losing weight on a liberal caloric high in protein and high in fat and low in carbs. Now, if you remember, you heard that before. You heard that before back in the Banting diet. Remember that? 1863, almost identical. And that was in the UK, of course. So he's had success in the US. He becomes, in essence, the specialist for treating obesity. The other thing was that we're going to talk about this a little more at length today, is that Dr. Atkins read this article, and he was a young cardiologist of 28 at the time, And he read this and started to work with diets with his patients as well. We'll hear more about that. So the second publication in 1958, pretty much by the identical uh, topic, was Eat Fat, Get Slim. And this exposed, again, the calorie fallacy and proposed non-carbohydrate, Stone Age diet of protein and fat with no restriction as to the amount eaten. Pretty much what we're hearing from the Dr. Pennington story in JAMA. He's saying no carbs at all. So you might want to call this the zero-carb diet. Zero-carb is a pretty contemporary reference to not having carbs. 
In this case, they're saying Stone Age diet, assuming that their Stone Age people didn't have carbs. The book was immensely popular, went through six editions, and the forward it was interesting. The forward of this book, you know, there's, there's a forward in the book. The forward of this book was written by the wife of the Arctic explorer, Eliamur Stephenson. Remember I talked at length about from Eliamur Stephenson, and he came back from working with the Inuits and said, hey, I don't need carbs, and you can study me and my colleague for one year, 24-7, for one year, and document everything we eat, and we will show you how you do not need carbs. So what's also interesting is that the, the wife who, the Yammer Stephenson, died in 2009. I grew up in Hanover, New Hampshire, and that's where they were living the whole time. I never met them. Would have been an interesting story. But um, she was reflecting back and writing that forward, and that it was her husband, who was still alive in 1958, saying, let's go back and eat the Stone Age diet. And they obviously collaborated a little bit with the author of this particular publication. Pretty interesting, huh? So, all right, now let's get into what I consider the modern era of the ketogenic diet. In essence, we have two competing views on how to implement it. They're hardly competing in the big picture, but we're going to split hairs and say that they're competing views. One competing view is, well, let's have a little carbs. You know, what are, what is, what are a few carbs? What's a small amount of carbohydrate? Are we talking 20 or 10 or 15 grams? So that's going to be the little tweak. And others are going to say, no carbs at all. Let's just forget about the carbs. The other variable that will be ill-defined pretty much at this point, um, this is now up to 1970, still we're saying, well, just high fat. So nobody's measuring how much fat. And the idea of how much protein is still a little vague. It's still, in other words, there, we talked about in the classic ketogenic diet, you remember that last time in which it was a, a gram per kilogram of body weight? Well, now we're in the 1970s. And Dr. Atkins' diet is now a whole program. Dr. Atkins' diet was based on the Dr. Pennington's obesity booklet or publication called Weight Loss. So we now sort of have a sliding forward of things that have pretty much been unchanged since the time of a Banting diet in the mid-60s in England, which was primarily due to Dr. Harvey. And he ruined his practice by treating his, his patients this way. Can you imagine? That's a whole other thing that I touched on last time. But uh, Dr. Harvey, I think, is the one who really put this, uh, set the sails for this particular course of very low carbs or no carbs, high fat, and appropriate, it was ill-defined, but we'll call it a, uh, an adequate amount of protein on a daily basis. Okay, so Dr. Atkins is away and running. He starts his program, 1970s, and he targets anyone whose objective is to lose weight restore what he would consider metabolic efficiency, a shift from carbohydrate to fat burning. His objective was, and I believe he achieved, was to stabilize insulin, reduce inflammation, as well as prevent and manage cardiometabolic disorders like type 2 diabetes. Right on the mark. So he's, in essence, this, these are my words, he's in essence sliding back to the use of the classic ketogenic diet, which came out of the Mayo Clinic, in 1921, and it was very popular for 10 years. Remember, we're talking about very popular for 10 years until the medications for treating, diet, uh, treating epilepsy became so popular that this particular diet faded away, except at Johns Hopkins. Okay then, so Dr. Atkins developed his diet, high protein, high fat, nearly no carbs, nearly no carbs. Emphasis was on meat, cheese, eggs, discouraging carbs like bread, pasta, fruits, and sugar. Weight loss was kickstarted during this phase, which is considered phase one, which requires followers to consume under 20 grams of carbs per day for at least two weeks. The focus should be on the high fat, high protein foods alongside low carb veggies like leafy greens, peppers, cruciferous vegetables. So you notice one of the, if you're thinking into the future, well, high protein, what hadn't been developed yet was the idea that protein itself can actually, too much protein after you're using it to build muscles and so on. And uh, too much protein actually can be converted into glucose through the liver, a process of gluconeogenesis. So that hadn't been very well defined, but he was on it. And there is subsequent to this particular diet, now what they call the new or the modified Atkins came out in about 1910. So it's everything's in a process of evolution. This is what it was then. And you now know the origins of this go back nearly 100 years before. 
Okay, 1971, another diet comes along. And this is really back to treating the epilepsy, the epileptic uh, pediatrics. This is called the MCT diet. So the MCT stands for medium chain triglycerides. And so we talked about those before. Those are, we're going to refer to them as C8, C10, and C12. Primarily, it's really just C8 and C10. Uh, You can get MCT oil nearly in any grocery store now, certainly any health food store, and certainly on Amazon. And when you buy a bottle of that, that is caprylic acid, C8, triglyceride, and decanoic acid, C10, triglyceride. That's what you're getting. It's about a 60-40 split. Usually a larger amount of C8, but it varies on the brand, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, 1971, the reason there was such a thing as the MCT diet was because epileptic children that were either drug resistant to their medications and not help their seizures at all, or their parents didn't want to go on, have their kids go on the medications because they felt drugged out, all the side effects. So they went on the diet, but the diet was still problematic. It was a classic ketogenic diet of 20 grams of carbohydrates a day. And you know the, the list of food is getting very specific. So the idea was that if you gave them a very efficient form of fat, MCT, because MCT, specifically C8, mostly, will be converted very efficiently into ketones almost immediately. Within C8, within 15 minutes, goes to the liver, gets created into ketone bodies. So that was brought into the epileptic diet regime because if you gave them a more efficient fat for creating ketones, well, they wouldn't have to eat as much fat, and therefore they could have a little more liberal diet. They could possibly even have something some of their friends would have, maybe not sugar and cupcakes and so on and so forth, but they could get closer to a little more normal food. A lot of parents are feeling their kids are getting ostracized by being different, and certainly that was the case, as anybody would now know with have children with allergies and food allergies specifically, that they have, a, have to have a special diet. So that was the thinking there. Let's liberalize the diet for the pediatric, for the kids that have epilepsy, and Let's see what happened. So in 1971, they actually had a Dr. Peter Hottenlocker out of the University of Chicago, who was a great advocate of the ketogenic diet. When it started falling out of favor in the 20th century, as we just talked about, due to new anticonvulsant drugs, he was adamant that the ketogenic diet was still effective form of therapy and that new patients would try the diet if it resembled a normal diet more closely. He replaced some of the long, uh, sorry, long chain fats found in creams and butters and oils, et cetera, with the medium chain fats, the, the more efficient fats. So the medium chain fats, MCTs, are more effective, more effectively absorbed than the long chain fats. It does not require, uh, I'll just leave it at, it's just more effective. So that was kind of a breakthrough. So he found in his studies that the result is less overall fat is needed in the diet. 70 to now 75% of the MCT ketogenic diet comes from the fat versus the classic ketogenic diet, which about 90% has to, 90% of fat, of the calories come from fat. So that was a big deal. Okay. And jumping forward in time on the MCT diet. So I just told you the MCT diet was created in 1971 to liberalize the diet for uh, pediatric epilepsy. So in 2018, 47 years later, that we come and we finally have a study on the medium chain triglyceride diets. And this is really interesting. This just came out last week. So this is January 5th, 2018. This is how new an old diet is, but we're looking more closely. So there is a new component here. Some studies have challenged the rule, central role of ketones because medium chain fatty acids, told you what they are, which are part of a commonly used variation of the diet called medium chain triglyceride ketogenic diet, which I just told you about, have been shown to directly inhibit certain particular receptors, stimulating receptors, called glutamate receptors on uh, neurons, and have been shown to directly inhibit, that is calm, calm the nerves, and therefore reduce the seizures, and to change cell energetics to mitochondrial biogenesis, which simply means helping to generate more healthier uh, mitochondria, which are the energy blocks that we all know. And they're pretty much in every cell of your body except the uh, red blood cell. Okay, through these mechanisms, medium chain fatty acids rather than ketones are likely to block seizures onset and raise the seizure threshold. So this 
what I'm trying to say is this old idea of oils, of fats, more specifically MCTs, going forward saying, you know, it might not be only the ketones. They're not saying it's not the ketones. It might not be only the ketones, but it could be the fats that are blocking or inhibiting the stimulating receptors so things calm down. Interesting. Interesting idea. It's only one study. It doesn't mean the whole thing's out there. It's going to have to be redone probably 20 times to really get a sense of this is true. Jumping forward now a little more, 1980s, Dr. Stephen Finney, he's an internist who's actually taught at a number of different medical schools, studies high-fat, low-carb diets for endurance athletes and starting to show it has some advantages. And this actually becomes a big, big deal. Jeff Fullick gets involved in, uh, this is now post-200. So the early works of looking at ketogenic diet for endurance athletes started in the 1980s became more and more interesting. Uh, it became so formalized that there's now teams. There's now football teams, rug- rugby teams, soccer teams internationally, lacrosse teams internationally on this because of the, uh, the boost it gives them for endurance sports. Okay, here's a little update on that. So I just said Dr. Stephen Finney. So in 19, this is a fascinating story coming up. So in 2016, 2016, there was a Finnish Initially, foreign student that uh, came from Finland to study at Stanford to get his MBA. And uh, long story short, while I was looking for a cheap place to stay in uh, Palo Alto, in that area, he invented a way of looking for what was available for apartments and so on. And so he started a software that then led to a real estate software. And that software is called um, Trulia. It's a competitor to Zillow, should you know. Anyway, his name is... Sammy uh, Inkinen, and uh, he became, if not a billionaire, pretty close because of that. I don't think he ever had to complete his MBA, by the way. So this guy, who's now a billionaire, he decides that he and his wife are going to row to Hawaii from Monterey and uh, as a two-man. There's been other rowboats, so we're going to say they're specially designed, of course. There's been other rowboats that have gone out and done this, and so it's an established race, but there have not been that many two people, two-person rowing, and the record was about 60 days. So he contacted Dr. Finney and said, I want you to put together a diet for me and my wife that we will, you know, pack in this boat for 60 days worth of supplies just to make sure we make it there. And with the emphasis on the ketogenic diet, high fat, low carb, adequate protein. So the great, uh, the story is great when Dr. Finney talks about this, but anyway, he did it. So not only did they have 60 days worth of food, but they beat the record by 15 days. <laughs> by 15 days? That's amazing. Here's the other thing. When they showed up, they weren't exhausted. They were actually stronger for it. They were not exhausted. They came out uh, fitter, in quotes. I don't know what those uh, variables are, but they came out more fit when they finished the race than when we started in terms of uh, cardiovascular health, muscle, and I'm sure bone health and everything else. Funny, huh? So anyway, after that, Sammy and his wife were obviously very impressed. They decided to coerce, I say that in a nice way, uh, Dr. Finney. And then, of course, Jeff Jeff Volek, which is working with Dr. Finney. This is now 1916. I'm jumping around in time. And they started, are starting a company called Verta Health. And Verta Health is solely designed to reverse type 2 diabetes. Okay, and off and away. And so when you hear about Verta Health in the future, you'll see amazing studies coming through on that. But there you go. The use of a ketogenic diet for another endurance sports. It was a two-man operation. So as I mentioned, you'll hear a lot about Verta Health in the coming years. And I believe in this next week or two of 2018, they'll be coming out with their first study. So this is totally going to turn uh, the world of diabetes primarily type two on its head. And you can bet that it's going to go a lot into endurance sports and so on and so forth. Okay. Now back to the timeline that I had, but isn't that interesting story about Verta Health and uh, Sammy Inkinen and his uh, race to Hawaii from Monterey with his wife. So in 1989, the first comparative study was completed of the metabolic effects of the classic ketogenic diet and the MCT ketogenic diet. This is done showing that they're equally effective. Now I pause for a second 
because yes, I told you that in 1921, the ketogenic diet was defined, established, planned and implemented, and it was incredibly uh, popular for the better part of a decade. But it's this new era of the ketogenic diet, this new era of medicine, actually, about really reproducing studies. They now have uh, very precise, even if we're just talking about a ketone meter or a, gluc- a glucometer, but obviously way beyond that, the, the parameters and the controls they can put on a diet are have never really existed before, but also they're trying to reproduce these things. So the reproducibilities of studies is really what is an element of the modern era of uh, the ketogenic diet, modern era of medicine. So that's what's happening now. So when I say this, you would have thought uh, that somebody would have thought about comparing the keto, classic ketogenic diet to the MCT diet a long time ago. Certainly 20 years had passed since it would first had been created at the University of Chicago, Chicago in 1971. Okay, 1990, Dr. Eris Westman, who had worked directly with Dr. Atkins, he develops an actual specialty. I don't mean he personally. There is such a thing as a specialty in obesity medicine. So the specialty, you could say, came out of Dr. Atkins and before Dr. Atkins, Dr. Pennington. And so he practices at Duke And uh, he has an incredible ability to be very thorough with patients and take each patient where they are and does not make it so uh, constrictive. I so appreciate his perspective, his ability, his gentle ability to make everybody just take whatever step they can in the right direction of decreasing their carbs. And I would say, and perhaps I heard it from him first. If you do have a patient that has five meals a day at McDonald's, then maybe the first thing you might want to recommend that they do is not include the bun and maybe not include the French fries. But that's where one can start as they eventually become competent at knowing what 20 carbs, and his goal is to have 20 carbs or less or fewer uh, per day. But that's where he'd start. So everybody takes their step forward and eventually gets better and better at control. Okay, in 1994, I mentioned this before, this is the NBC Dateline report on Charlie Abrams, a four-year-old with severe epilepsy. His father is a TV, is a, a movie director and a, a movie producer, and they had treated their son with all sorts of possibilities, and nobody had ever brought up the ketogenic diet. And when he was at one of his lectures that uh, had taken place at a hospital. Apparently he found a copy of the, from the John Hopkins of the key, classic ketogenic diet for pediatric epilepsy. So, and with that, he followed up directly with Johns Hopkins and never looked back. And so he was so overwhelmed. First, he was really grateful. Once I think it was the first day. Remember I told you that the children have uh, two days of fasting before they begin the diet. They begin the diet a third and then two thirds and then a hundred percent of the ketogenic diet. Um, they reported after the very first day, there was a decrease. He sensed there's a, a change in his, his, uh, in Charlie. He consequently, they, he and his wife consequently go on to create the Charlie foundation for pediatric epilepsy, which has been changed to the Charlie foundation for the ketogenic diet. They were the perfect people to catch hold of this and to have this experience because he knew how to use the media. He went on, he, he went on uh, Dateline, had the report done on Dateline with some of the doctors that had treated before, the non-ketogenic doctors, and asked uh, Ted Koppel, asked some very straightforward questions. And uh, you realize that there is a big deficiency in how we treat epilepsy in terms of uh, conventional medicine. So from that, in 1995, there's two studies done. This is, again, through uh, Charlie's Charlie's father, uh, Jim Abrams, do a multi, first multi-center study on uh, pediatric epilepsy, but I'll get to that in a second because that's later in time. In 1995, we have the first study done on classic ketogenic diet as a, an additional therapy for two different kinds of cancers. That's pretty impressive. So remember, I started this particular broadcast with telling you about 1918 and not a Warburg, and, he's, and he had discovered that cancer survives in a low oxygen environment and that it relies entirely on sugar. Well, 
Now let's come fast forward. And what they did here, one particular of these two particular cases that I'm going to tell you about is that he implemented, implemented a ketogenic diet based on medium chain triglyceride oil. So I told you about that, the MCT diet in a pediatric patient with cancer. So a pediatric patient with cancer. And you know, tr traditionally, a ketogenic diet was given to drug-resistant children with epilepsy to improve seizure control. It was a fallback. It had been the big thing, and then it lost popularity, but it's considered the fallback. If nothing at work, show them the ketogenic diet. So in do say a ketogenic state in patients with cancer may be useful as an adjunct treatment to cancer by affecting tumor glucose metabolism and growth while maintaining the patient's nutritional status. So back to Warburg. He said it depended on glucose, cancer depended on glucose to grow. Now we're having a ketogenic diet that is saying, no, not this has nothing to do with glucose. We are about helping the body make ketone bodies, and that's going to be the source of fuel. So that particular diet was 60% MCT oil, 20% protein, 10% carbs. Pretty impressive, huh? And it had favorable outcomes. There's For those who are interested and want to post a questions, I can put that in the show notes, the reference to this particular diet. And that was done at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland. So not some far off remote area of the world, but right in um, the United States. So the second was the effect of a ketogenic diet on tumor metabolism and nutritional status in pediatric oncology patients. And this was on a cancer, what they call astrocytoma. So two female pediatric patients with advanced stage, malignant stage of astrocytomas were followed as outpatients for eight weeks. Ketosis was maintained, a 60% MCT diet, 60% uh, medium chain triglyceride oil-based diet. Tumor glucose metabolism was assessed by a PET scan. That's uh, a scan in which you get to see the glucose uptake and various parts of the brain. So if you have cancer, you will see, and it has a, a radioisotope, so you can see it light up. So you can see what is taking up the highest glucose. So traditionally, you'd see a cancer. That's one of the ways you would detect cancer because it would light up, light up that part of the screen. So that's how they're looking at, is the cancer getting better or worse, or is it disappearing? So the results of the PET scans indicated that 21.8% average decrease in glucose uptake at the tumor sites in both subjects. That's a big deal. So that also is from Case Western. So the idea of starving a cancer of its fuel supply, glucose, and supplying ketone bodies by a ketogenic diet as an alternative fuel is a much older idea based on the work of Otto Warburg. Okay, um, things that I think are valuable to know is that if we're thinking about cancer, and we're going to go deeper as a whole other episode on cancer in the future, not too far, but probably in a month, so not just immediately around the corner, is that the cancer process itself is what produces the lack of oxygen, not the lack of oxygen which causes the cancer. I'm going to tell you why I'm saying that in just a second. And the other thing is, this is from Warburg, it is the cancer process itself which causes the body to become increasingly acidic by its using utilization of glucose. Not that the environment has become acidic and therefore promotes cancer. So why do I just say about those two things? It is, I won't say it's common knowledge. I guess it's common wrong knowledge, common misunderstood knowledge. It's common, it's not true. And yet everybody feels that it is true. And that is idea is like, well, you need to alkalize your body to have it be cancer free. Well, the intention is correct, but it is the cancer that causes the acidic environment in a very small, in essence, encapsulated area. And so, yes, that environment is very acidic. And if you can make that environment, it's actually not even proven. The thinking is that people say, oh, I need to alkalize your body. Is saying, well, if you can alkalize your body, then an acidic environment couldn't exist. That's the logic there, which hasn't been proven, but that's why people say, oh, you need to eat this diet to alkalize your body. There's an element of truth, but those two things have not been connected. And the other one is, oh, you need to get oxygen, you know, into those cells to kill the, now we're talking about tumor cells. Well, that technically is true, but the problem is it's very difficult to get oxygen into cells, deep into the cells. And so these truths, and, and there's a lot of bogus products out there, in my opinion, that have people, cancer patients, spending time and money, and mostly it's time, if you ask me, on really the wrong things. And um, 
the ketogenic diet is being so studied now for cancer. Now, remember, it started in 1995. And now it's becoming more and more and more coming out. That's why I was going to do a whole other episode on cancer because it's more than just a couple studies. But that's the point. If That's why I brought up those two points. It's the cancer causes the low oxygen environment because it doesn't need oxygen. It uses sugar. It uses glucose. And because it uses glucose, it's an acidic environment. So that's what you need to know. Those are the facts. All right, 1997, back to Jim Abrams, the father of Charlie. Uh, he, they actually, he produces a movie like he does. He's in a lot of really interesting movies. First Do No Harm, Meryl Streep, and it becomes a big deal. It's actually on, I think, ABC or NBC, one of the big networks. So it's front and center. He's smart enough to have worked with John Hopkins and all these others to make sure that he knows a lot of epileptic fa- uh, families with epileptic children are going to see this and they're going to realize, why don't I try the diet? So he had to make, educate, he they did a lot of back work on educating various hospitals and clinics to get ready for the calls that are coming in. And sure enough, Johns Hopkins was flooded with calls after this to for patients, and they had to refer them out to all these other various hospitals that now had been brought up to um, uh, brought up to speed on how to implement for pediatric epileptics uh, the the classic ketogenic diet. Fascinating. So it's a, the amount of work this family has done to change the course of history in terms of the classic ketogenic diet for epilepsy is amazing. Absolutely. So 1998, this is what I had mentioned briefly before, um, Jim Abrams helped fund the first ever multi-centered study of the efficacy of the ketogenic diet for pediatric epilepsy. So you're probably wondering, well, why isn't that kind of redundant? Isn't that kind of a waste of money? Um, because it's been out there since 1921. They have a lot of cases. They have a lot of data. It's true, but it was in an era in which things were not that precise. So he, in essence, brought the they, their family, he and his wife, Nancy, uh, single-handedly brought this into the 21st century, if you ask me, about the classic ketogenic diet, what it does, why it's effective, and um, the rest is history, as they say. So... That's what they did. The question then becomes, after that, really at this point forward, could these ketone bodies, you know, through ketosis, could the ketone bodies from the ketogenic diet be used to treat or prevent other diseases? What are other potential uses of BHB, beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is pretty much the key ketone body that uh, is, is what everybody's talking about and then the one that uh, does most of the work, we believe, at this point. So the answer is, Yes, ketone bodies can really be applied to any condition where the oxygen supply to cells has become limited, therefore any disease state. Interesting. So that's like the gate is wide open. And let me give you a sense of what has happened, and I mentioned this a little bit before, is that since 2000, going back to 1900, since studies and such were even tabulated, there is a total of 225 studies done on the ketogenic diet since 2000 to, two, to tw- 2000 to uh, 2015 over 1400 studies have been done on the ketogenic diet now we're in 2018 uh, it is estimated as well over 2000 studies so that's the kind of focus now we have NIH various hospitals it's international it's just going nuts so this is when people say this is a fad or this is just another you know it's it's incomparable, the amount, the tonnage of research that is being done by various serious research centers all over the world has never, has never ever happened for any particular diet-associated treatment in conventional medicine. So this was pretty much the heart of my reason for why would I do a podcast on the ketogenic diet. Uh, one was to dispel the idea that this is just another fad diet. But as we get into it, and this is just setting context, and I really wanted to sit, lay down the foundation so we understand the context which this came from, because we're going to be referring back to this in future episodes. But also, we can go beyond keto. I don't mean we're going to find some other diet, but I mean, we're going to use the ketogenic diet. We can use certain ketogenic diets and be aware of certain additional things that will make it even a more specified uh, tool that all of us can use for day-to-day health or for a particular serious disorder. Okay, so 
Studies are increasing, and I wanted to name off some of these. In 2004, we had physical performance, Alzheimer's, depression, 2005. So these had never been done before. Now that now the, the cover's been ripped off and they're looking for neurological diseases, um, certainly the Alzheimer's and the depression. Physical performance, I mentioned uh, Dr. Finney before. Now many others are doing it. It's They're all over the place. It's amazing. 2005, Parkinson's, a neurological disease. A traumatic brain injury, a neurological uh, injury. And we, we hear a lot about that through football and so on and so forth, car accidents and so on. So that's a big deal. I'm also setting the stage while I'm naming these things off. You can be thinking about, well, should we use exogenous ketones for all these things? Should we use a ketogenic diet? These are the questions I'm going to toss off to the future. That is the next episode. And we'll get into that a little more deeply, but um, you be thinking of that. Also, so I said Parkinson's, TBI, type 2 diabetes, uh, La Fornia body disease, which is a genetic form of uh, progressive epilepsy, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, very much associated with, it's obviously a hormonal disorder, but strongly associated with uh, diabetes, dysglycemia, blood sugar, and met- metabolic syndrome. 2006, ALS, another neurological disease, otherwise known as Lou Gehrig's disease. 2007, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, migraines. And by the way, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the name says it, has nothing to do with the cirrhosis that you would get by uh, having too much alcohol, it actually has been, uh, the incidence has been increasing and the presumption is it's increasing uh, in um, step with the amount of carbs, sugars in our diets internationally. Okay, the shift to the keto metabolism goes far beyond the swapping of one fuel for another. Most of the modern diseases of civilization can benefit from this. Obesity, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, which is actually considered type 3 diabetes. We'll get into that later. 2010, I've mentioned him before, Dr. Jeff Volek. He's at Ohio State. He used to be at UConn. I said that only because I had practice in Connecticut, Then it's a small state. And I was surprised that he started there. So in 2010, he began research on endurance athletes' metabolism, the ketogenic diet. He co-authored three books, The Art and Science of Low-Carbohydrate Living, Art and Science of Low-Carbohydrate Performance, and The New Atkins Diet, co-authored with Dr. Westman. So the first two were co-authored with Dr. Stephen Finney. I told you about him. And they now are have established, strongly associated with uh, Ohio State, is Verda Health. So uh, we expect to hear a lot of good things coming out of that. It should be amazing. So the concept now at this time of saturated fats as being bad fats. Remember I mentioned last time that in the early 60s, Ansel Keys, he was the man of the year in time, and he came out and said saturated fats are bad, and he felt it was a correlation of the amount of saturated fats that you ate was a correlation of uh, you would have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, strokes. And so he said worldwide, and he did this diagram of the average side of various cultures. Well, he handpicked those, ends up it's, it was a bogus research, unfortunately, but it controlled, influenced, strongly influenced the dietary recommendations for the next 60, 70 years up until the present. So right now, that concept of saturated fats as being bad is now openly challenged. The use and the promotion of MCT oil, saturated fats, remember C8, C10, is starting to gain popularity. This is where we are. Uh, basically, that started around 2010. You could say before, but um, I wanted to throw in a few other, you know, it, it's so rich for what's happening right now. You almost need to do it on a weekly basis to say what's going on, and maybe we will in the future. But what I consider other big milestones that have happened that should be considered is that I had mentioned, and it was 1995, that those two studies in of uh, pediatric epileptic cancer patients both benefited from the ketogenic diet as an adjunctive therapy. Well, in 2004, Dr. Thomas Sedfried, who's from Boston College, he comes out with a book. It's a bit of a tome, but he really cracks the world open in terms of the ketogenic diet and cancer. And he comes out with a book called Cancer as a Metabolic Disease. The concept is now, you sort of had a heads up on that, is in general, cancers are adapted to glucose as a source of fuel exclusively and cannot use ketones, develops a calorie-restricted diet as a therapy, 
he illustrates, he has a really neat illustration of, he has two cells, a healthy cell and an unhealthy cell, and he switches the nucleus. That is, he takes the cancer nucleus or the nucleus of a cancer cell, puts it in the healthy cell, and then he puts the healthy nucleus into the cancer cell and to see what would happen. Well, the cancer nucleus in the healthy cell basically becomes health. I'll leave out a lot of details. Becomes health. The healthy nucleus put into the cancer cell becomes cancerous. So therefore, it wasn't about the nucleus. It was about the metabolism of the cell, the mitochondria. That's the spoiler alert. It's about the mitochondria for the most part. Okay, in 2006, I mentioned before, the great book comes out, Survival of the Fat is the Key to Human Brain Evolution, which is basically about a high-fat diet that we needed to be at the right place, eating the right source of fats for a long period of time. And by Dr. Stephen Kinney, who's a uh, a neurological expert at the Sherbrooke University in Canada, in Quebec. I've corresponded with him, and uh, he's so interesting to talk to for the minutes that he can spare. So uh, the idea was shellfish, fish, shore-based, shore-based animals, and plants are the richest dietary sources of key nutrients needed by the brain. Think of omega-3s, uh, EPA and DHA. And uh, you probably didn't know, but shellfish were the higher source, highest source of B12. And I bring that up because those who are on a vegetarian or vegan diet end up being B12 deficient. You can also get B12 through other meat sources, of course. Uh, but I thought the idea of his concept of evolution in general depends on a special combination of circumstances, part genetics, part time, and part environment. So the environment was the seacoast. The main environmental influence was adaptation to a shore-based diet, which provided the world's richest source of nutrition, as well as a sedentary lifestyle, sit around and get fat, so to say. 2008, first randomized control trial, proving the efficacy of the ketogenic diet for the management of epilepsy. You're going, wait a minute, didn't we already study that? Well, now this is the first randomized control style. And obviously it came out with very good results. 2014, ketogenic diet and calorie restriction show promise in improving cancer outcomes. We're drilling down a little bit. So it's a ketogenic diet, now restricting calories as well. So it's nowhere near fasting, but it's not a full-on uh, calorie, full diet, full calorie diet for any particular patient. We're going to get into these later, so I'm just scooting by. I'm trying to give you the context of the chronology and where we are today. 2014, neurological conditions that are studied, ketones used as therapy, even though it was studied before it's ongoing is what I'm saying. Uh, we hear a great story by Dr. Mary Newport, whose husband ended up having Alzheimer's and that she incorporated MCT oils and it made a big difference. He did eventually pass in 2016, but uh, it's an amazingly uh, documented story. It's sad, of course. Parkinson disease benefits from a ketogenic diet. MS, there's uh, a doctor named uh, Terry Walls, who's at the Cleveland Institute. And she was so immobilized by MS that she was going around in a motorized uh, wheelchair for her grand rounds. She started a form of the ketogenic diet she calls the Walls Protocol, and she's up and about and bicycling and running and amazing. So we're back with Tim Noakes, which I ended on last time. I just wanted to give you um, just some further catch up. And he had a two, two and a half year case in which they were trying to remove his license, conventional medicine in South Africa, and he was exonerated just... Uh, four weeks, I don't even think two months ago. And he had doctors testifying on his behalf internationally. Okay, what else? We're coming up to the end here. And we have Dr. Kane basically shows through his research that C8 triglyceride is the most ketogenic fat of the MCT oils. And 2016, first exogenous ketone is created. We're getting into that big time next time. But I'll say that Dominique Agostino, who's down in Florida, collaborated with uh, Patrick Arnold, and they came up with a ketone salt. Primarily the motivation for this was a grant from the Department of Defense for helping SEAL, SEAL divers to not have seizures when exposed to their oxygen, to, to not have seizures due to oxygen toxicity from their mix. And so what that is, SEAL divers would dive under about 50 feet on these rebreathing apparatus. So it ended up being high oxygen and they could stay under without any bubbles and obviously being very secretive but that they would have, in essence, these epileptic seizures due to the oxygen toxicity. So uh, Dominic Augustino, Dr. Augustino, thought, well, maybe it's like ketogenic diet. Maybe we can make ketones. So he's the first to struggle with coming up with some sort of exogenous ketones. And sure enough, it was phenomenal. 
uh, not only that, that uh, not only the SEAL divers would be able to avoid oxygen toxicity, but for um, they could hold their breaths longer underwater than they could before. 2016, he, Dominic Agostino, and his department had the first international conference on the ketogenic diet, also the first low-carb conference started in the United States. 2017, as it, which is just last year, was exonerated by uh, the African court. And I'll end there. Part three will be about the brief history and possible uses of exogenous ketones. Are they the holy grail of ketosis or the next supplement fad? Till then. Thanks for listening. For anybody who has any questions, feel free to contact me on our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Same name as our podcast. I'm open to any questions and we plod through the good and the bad, the difficult and the easy week after week.